Welcome to worship at Webster Presbyterian Church. We are delighted that you are joining us today for the service of worship and praise. Before we begin the worship service, I have a few announcements. First of all, we, are, we will be having communion today as part of our service. So if you have not already prepared your elements for that, you might want to pause the video and get those ready for that portion of the service. Second, I want to let you know that we will be having an Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday, February 17 at 7 p.m. This will be a Zoom service. So a link for that will come out to you, as well as a video that will show you how to prepare your own ashes so that you can impose them on one another or if you're by yourself, on yourself. So we will uh, be getting that out to you soon. And finally, today we are having a congregational meeting. It, it, it is our annual meeting. It will be at 1 p.m. And so you will you should have received if a Zoom link for that already. So please join us for that meeting. You will uh, receive the budget and vote on terms of call for Keith and for me. And I think there are a few other items that have been put on that agenda. So look forward to that. And now, as I mentioned a couple of Sundays ago, we are offering a prayer each week for our nation. So this prayer is one that was offered in the prayer service that we did a few weeks ago. So please pray with me. O oh, wondrous God, you call us into this world to live as neighbors to one another, to increase the joy, peace, and love that exist among us. We have been blessed to live in such a place as the United States of America, where freedom rings and liberty prevails. We are so grateful. Freedom and liberty bring with them responsibility, responsibility to care for one another as you care for each of us. So we ask today that you guide this nation, its leaders and its citizens toward a more loving, more caring state of mind. Let us be the mercy we wish to see. Let us be the justice we want to experience. Let us show the love we want shown to us. Let us be courageous in the face of challenge. Let us be wise in our choice of words and actions. Please grant our leaders wisdom and discernment as they seek to draw our citizens back together in common cause, healing our wounds and the, and the divisions that create fear and distrust. Give all of us ears to listen and hearts to hear the deep needs of all the people. Let us take time to slow down and engage deeply in conversation with one another. May we listen with our strength, giving our time, energy, and complete attention to one another. We are a nation that rejoices in our relationship with you, O Holy One. Let us thus be guided by your light that shines in the darkness. Let us be the beacons on the hill that show the way toward freedom with within you to our neighbors. Let us join with friends of every faith as we turn to you to lead us out of the dark night into the bright light of the day that you have prepared for us. This nation was created in hope. Let us return to that hope, a hope that includes all, a hope that offers a hand down to the downtrodden, a hand to the downtrodden, a hope that provides opportunity to one and all a hope that ensures equality and equity for everyone. A hope that invites the stranger to share in the benefits of this great nation. A hope that leaves no one behind. Oh God, we repent our arrogance, pride, and greed. We offer ourselves as your willing servants to live as you have shown us you would have us live. We recognize that our burnt offerings and hollow words are repugnant to you that what you desire of us, is, of us is to love you with all our heart, strength, mind, and soul, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. When we follow the ways of Jesus, the way of Christ, you will bless us out of the bounty of your goodness. We pray in your holy name that all of this will be so. And all the people say, Amen.
And, O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Join me in the call to worship. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Prepare the way of the Lord. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Prepare the way of the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. We climb up on a high mountain, and lift our voices with strength, saying to the cities of the world, Here is your God. Let us pray. O holy and loving God, you have sent us the light of your world, your Son, Jesus Christ, to shine in the places where faith is covered with doubt and where hope is dimmed by despair. We ask that you will make Christ's light shine in and through us, so that we can share his goodness and love throughout this troubled world. And together we say, Amen. February is Black History Month, when we acknowledge and appreciate the accomplishments of African Americans in our country. So today I, I bring you a poem by Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Garman, A Message of Hope. I thought I'd awaken to a world in mourning, heavy clouds crowding, a society storming, but there's something different on this golden morning, something magical in the sunlight, wide and warming. I see a dad with a stroller taking a jog. Across the street, a bright-eyed girl chases her dog. A grandma on a porch fingers her rosaries and she grins as her young neighbor brings her groceries. While we might feel small, separate, and all alone, our people have never been more closely tethered. The question isn't if we will weather this unknown, but how we will weather this unknown together. Like light, we can't be broken even when we bend. As one, we will defeat both despair and disease. We stand with health care heroes and all employees, with families, libraries, schools, waiters, artists, businesses, restaurants, and the hospitals hit hardest. We ignite not in the light, but in the lack thereof, for it is in loss that we truly learn to love. In this chaos, we will discover clarity. In suffering, we must find solidarity. For it is our grief that gives us our gratitude, shows us how to find hope if we ever lose it. So ensure that this ache wasn't endured in vain. Do not ignore the pain, give it purpose, use it. Read children's books. Dance alone in DJ music. Know that this distance will make our hearts grow fonder. From a wave of woes, our world will emerge stronger. We'll observe how the burdens braved by humankind are also the moments that make us humans kind. Let every dawn find us courageous, brought closer, heading the light before the heed, the fight is over. And when this ends, we'll smile sweetly, finally seeing in testing times, we became the best of beings. of Christ my King, who eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God. Oh, 
of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for these have always been there for us. Please don't hold our past sins against us, but lead us in what is right and teach us your ways. Together, let us humbly go to God and ask forgiveness of our sins. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Holy and merciful God, in your presence, we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, and our offenses against you. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways, in wasting your gifts, in forgetting your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displease you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light and walk in your ways. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now, let us approach God silently with our individual confessions. Holy God, holy and mighty, Holy, immortal one, have mercy on us. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. May the God of mercy, who forgives you all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. And all people say, Amen. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to start today off with asking you a question. Have you ever accidentally called someone by the wrong name? Have you ever done that before? I have. I've actually probably done it a lot of times, but it kind of worries me sometimes. And so I feel like there's a lot of times when I don't use a person's name because I'm so afraid that I might accidentally say it wrong or I might have remembered it wrong. And uh, it just kind of makes me all nervous and worried because, you know, names are important. Names are super important. And our own personal name, that's really, really important to us, isn't it? So I wanted to read a story about names, about having your name called out. And I'm going to share this story straight from the Bible. It's a story about a boy named Samuel. Because I want to make sure everybody knows that God will actually call us by name. God actually will speak to us and say our names. So listen to this story, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how that could happen in our lives today. So here's the story. Samuel's mother, Hannah, wanted a son more than anything. So she prayed and asked God to give her one. 
Hannah promised God that if he would give her a son, she would help her son to know the Lord and to serve him all the days of his life. God gave Hannah her son that she asked for, and when he was old enough, Hannah kept her promise to God. She took her boy Samuel to the temple and presented him to the priest named Eli. Samuel served in the temple under Eli, and one night he was sleeping when he heard someone call his name. Samuel got up and he ran to Eli. Here I am, you called me, he said to Eli. I didn't call you, Eli answered. Go back to bed, Samuel. So Samuel went back to bed. Again, the Lord called out Samuel's name, Samuel. Samuel jumped out of bed and ran to Eli. Here I am, you called me. I didn't call you. Go back to bed, Eli answered a second time. The third time God called Samuel and Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. You called me, he said. Finally, Eli realized it was God who was calling Samuel. Go and lie down, boy. And if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel went back to bed and sure enough, Again, he heard the voice of God calling his name, Samuel, Samuel. And this time, Samuel answered the Lord and said, Speak, for your servant is listening. I think that's such an amazing story. And I wonder sometimes if we are listening to hear and recognize when it's God who's calling our name. And one of the things that I have learned in my life is that sometimes God calls with a very strong voice and it's very easy for us to know that he's calling us to do something in this world. Sometimes though, God will call us with a whisper. God will call us very softly and he will whisper a thought into our hearts. And sometimes it's hard for us to pay attention to the whispers. So today I thought would be a good day for us to think about that. Think about whether or not we need God to be loud in our lives or whether or not we can be still enough with our hearts to be able to hear when he whispers. But either way, we should always be listening for God to speak to us. I think one of the reasons I love the Samuel story is because a lot of people think that God only calls on grown-ups, And that's not true. Because Samuel was just a young boy when God called him. And I wanted to remind you that God knows your name and that God will call your name no matter how big you are, no matter how grown up you are. Even when we're kids, God needs us in this world to do good things in his name. So this week, be listening for whether God is whispering or whether he's telling you with a very loud voice what he needs you to do. Listen for him. And remember, he knows your name. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, please help me to listen for you when you call my name. Please help me to hear you when you whisper and when you speak loudly. Amen. Before I have our prayer of illumination, I would like to give a little bit of a sense of where the sermon's coming from. Uh, of late, um, people seem to feel a need to tell me where they're getting their sources of information. 
So they'll send me like a, an email and it'll have, I listen to these podcasts, I watch these TV shows, these are the magazines I read. And I'm curious why they do that, but it seems to be an attempt to show that they're very sophisticated and that they are very thought, thoughtful about where they're getting their information. Um, second thing I want to say that is kind of backdrop of this um, is if somebody asked me what the most vital statistic would be for how healthy a congregation would be, it would have nothing to do with the business metrics most people use. The single most important statistic for me is how many men and women uh, meet weekly together to have conversations, thoughtful conversations, around uh, that sacred text we call the Bible. Uh, worship's fine, um, big budgets are fine, membership's fine, but um, the real vitality of a congregation is tied to people who are intentional about getting together uh, to um, uh, be really almost interrogate with each other what a particular text might mean for people today. And with that in mind, I want to um, read two texts. Uh, first, I'm going to offer a prayer of illumination, which is really a writing from Rilke, uh, a favorite saying of mine that I've kept with me for a long, long time that I want to commend to you uh, as a good way to um, uh, recognize the importance of having what I would call a questioning faith. So I'm going to use this for our prayer. So hear these words. Be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer or answers. That's our hope for illumination. And the first text I want to read is from the book of Psalms. I'm just going to read Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. I commend the whole psalm to you. But this gets uh, at the whole source of um, where people get their information. Uh, hear these words. Happy are those who do not who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. And then because the word law is referenced here, hear these words, uh, this particular text from Deuteronomy chapter four, I mean chapter six, four through nine, is used uh, in every synagogue service around the world uh, every week. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our second lesson is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Today is the day the church um, sets aside worldwide to remember that Jesus was brought by uh, Mary Joseph to be um, dedicated to the Lord uh, in the temple. Uh, And then uh, in that same arena of text about that, there is a text where Jesus as a teenage boy shows up and begins to have conversations with older, older leaders. And um, I've always loved that text because it shows something that I would like to highlight, um, the notion of an inquisitive faith. So anyway, it's chapter 2 of Luke, uh, verses 41 through 52. So hear God's word. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, They went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was was in the group of the travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find Jesus... They returned to Jerusalem to find to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, among the elders, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard Jesus were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this. Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And he said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then 
he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And in this one sentence, it's set aside by itself. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For a framing question, let me pose this uh, for you to ponder. Um, what is the state of your faith journey this morning? Or perhaps if you're watching it at night this evening. Uh, are you backsliding? Think of Michael Jackson and his moonwalk where he looks like he's walking forward but he's going backwards. Or are you in a stalled or stagnant period? Or are you in a blowing and going, a highly flourishing, intense new uh, spurt of growth? If you use that as a continuum, backsliding to really, really growing to somewhere in between, where would you place yourself when it comes to uh, this word we use, faith? It's important to give consideration to that, and it frames sort of what I'd like to say today. Uh, I've always loved this story about Jesus at age 12. Uh, at age 12, I think I was just watching Andy Griffith still and doing what little teenage or young boys do, playing out in the yard. I certainly wasn't in a church, and I certainly wasn't thinking about spiritual questions, but there you have this 12-year-old Jesus who actually has engaged in some mischief, um, stayed in Jerusalem while his parents and the traveling group went on. I would have asked the same thing the mother did. What were you doing? And I don't know about his answer. Well, why didn't you think I would be here? Uh, but what I take from this story is, is something very interesting. It's a 12-year-old boy who is inquisitive, and he's asking questions. He has uh, the sign of somebody whose faith is not stagnant, nor stalled, nor backsliding. It's, it's curious. It's quizzical is what I like to call it. And I want to lift that up as something for us to, to ponder. Historically, Presbyterians have always said that we love God best by using our minds well. I wonder if you have given that some thought. Presbyterians really... Uh, claim to put ourselves in the service of God by uh, an intentional and willing use of our minds, which should, should suggest that we are quite quizzical uh, and that we also cope with a lot of doubt, which leads to new questions. Now, we can love God with our hearts, deep passion. There are a lot of heart-oriented Christians in the world, and that's certainly a way to be in the service of God. And and you could have a great mind and a heart at the same time, but we privilege the use of our minds. You certainly can love God with your hands. Millard Fuller used to say he loved God by using a hammer whenever he built a new home through Habitat for Humanity or Fuller Center for Housing. And Jimmy Carter actually used to say that he prayed with his feet uh, in his life of diplomacy and peacemaking. I've heard both of them say that before. But I want to call attention to the fact that, uh, at least within the Presbyterian tradition, we intend to serve God uh, uh, by using our minds very well. Uh, Jesus, here in this story, depicts that inquisitive nature and, uh, and an answering nature. And I want to highlight that. When I was reading this text over again this morning, um, I had just talked to my young grandson, Pierce, and uh, every time I'm around Pierce, I'll say the sky is blue, and he'll say, why? I'll say the chocolate tastes good, and he'll say, why? I'll say the car is going too fast, and he'll say, why? He will why me until I am totally exhausted. I've actually tested this with him on purpose, and he asked me about 25 times in a row, Why? That's a good way to be. He is inquisitive. He is quizzical. He is interested in things he does not understand or know. 
And I want to lift up this why as a way to love God with the use of your mind. And to get there, I want to encourage you with three, three points. They're all fairly simple. The first is to think of the Christian life as a questioning life. Uh, I would go so far as to say that I don't think you can have a vital faith if there is a, a lack of doubt. Faith without doubt is credulity. It's a little bit like loving Santa Claus. It's willful credulity. That's not faith. Faith is uh, staking your life on mysteries that you cannot see. It's a risk, if you will, that this is the best, best way to go. Um, it's a, a willingness to pose incredibly difficult questions that have haunted people for generations. In our quizzical class, we're getting ready to study uh, how can there be a God when there's so much evil in the world? Questioning, questioning, questioning is the only way that a faith can be vital. It's the only way a faith can steadily grow over time. And it is a little bit like peeling an onion back. Every layer reveals a new layer. Every question reveals a new question. And it is through the questioning that one really begins to get a deep and abiding faith. So in Psalm 1, there is this conversation about some people are willing to go with those who have a negative view of life, the scoffers, the sinners, and such. Um, lacking critical thinking, they're more willful people, but they really like to think about the negatives of life. There are a lot of people doing that now. It's part of the problem with political ideology. Is it so negative and divisive? And the, the people before us, the, the people who gave us the Bible, recognize that there are two vital questions that matter for life. Who is God if there is a God? And who is our neighbor? And do we love our neighbor? Those two questions are the key questions of a questioning life. They're essential. They're not answered ever completely. And they're not answered at one stage in a life. They're questions that have to be asked at every stage of life. Who is God when you're in your 20s is one question. Who is God when you're nearing the end of your life? That's another question. And both questions are key to ask. But you can't do it by yourself the whole idea of what they call the living Bible is for men and women to get together and to have constant conversations, meeting in session, trying to tease out what these ancient words might suggest about current life. So the first dimension of a vital Christian faith is to have a questioning life. The second dimension of a Christian life is to have an answering life. It's an old saying, you can think your way into a new way of doing, but you can also do your way into a new way of thinking. Presbyterians also say, in addition to using our minds well, that we need to be doers of the word. Roll up our sleeves and get busy. Talking about the poor is not the same thing as living with and getting to know and working with real poor people. The issues about justice intensify when you actually are around people who are living with injustice. It's one thing to have a conversation about feeding the hungry in a Sunday school class. It's another thing to be among hungry people and recognize, wow, we've got to get some food. So another way of intensifying the Christian life is to get busy. And if you want to know how to get busy, just use the sermon that Jesus preached in his first sermon in his hometown. He took the scroll of Isaiah and he said, I'm going to feed the hungry. I'm going to clothe the naked. I'm going to set people who are in bondage free. And I'm going to make sure that people get a cup of cold water. This is what I'm going to do with my life. And see, it's if you start doing that stuff, if you go to the pain of the world, it will change 
the way you understand all of life. It's an answering life. If Jesus says, go feed the hungry, then get busy. If Jesus says to provide shelter for somebody that does not have shelter, get busy. Christianity is not meant to to sit in a pew. Christianity is really a doing religion. So the first dimension of a vital faith is to have a, a questioning life, to use your mind well. The second is to get busy, and in the getting busy, in the doing of what Jesus says, you will move into a deeper and deeper questioning life, and it's like a cycle which allows you to, to grow and to be vital. And finally, Christianity, to be vital, is a practicing faith. I've been a coach for 35 years in various sports. Um, I learned a long time ago the truth of what I was taught when I was a young athlete. We play like we practice. I'm assuming that's true for musicians as well. It's hard to stand in front of somebody and play a violin if you hadn't practiced. Well, it's hard to have a meaningful faith and a dedicated faith if you never actually are intentional about the practice. I'll give you one practice. It's a simple practice about the interior life. Use this text, Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. Examine me, O God, and know my mind. Probe me and know my thoughts. See if I have vexatious ways and guide me in the ways everlasting. That's a text to be actualized. And how do you get involved in something called examine me, O oh God? Well, you use an examine. So I'll give you a 1,400-year-old examine. It's called the examine of consolation and desolation. I've been doing this 35 years probably uh, at night in some form. used to write. Now I don't. But when you go to bed, you examine the day, and you ask two questions. What has contributed to the consolations, the 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 happiness of your day, and then ponder what is really brought desolation or discomfort or unhappiness in your day, and then ponder those things, and then after that, uh, go back to the old-fashioned practice of having a prayer, consolations, think about uh, how maybe you move closer towards God on any given day. Or maybe how you have um, developed a new acceptance of people that you don't really care for. Or perhaps you've been able to discover and accept some realism with regard to yourself. Or perhaps you've been exposed in some way to the divine presence uh, in a deeper and a broader and a wider perspective. Or perhaps you have discovered a little hope in a season of meaninglessness or despair, such as times such as these. Or perhaps you have developed a new assurance and acceptance of how to live with the tensions that are in your life that threaten to undermine your assurance. Or on the desolation side, perhaps you recognize that you have turned on yourself with too much violence, that you have an unreasonable self-loathing that is getting in the way of the fact that you are beloved of God. Perhaps you are experiencing some kind of psychic numbness. You've pushed yourself too hard and your body is telling you to stop and rest. Perhaps you're dispirited because you have a more of a sense of the absence of God than the presence of God. Or perhaps you're worn out by loneliness or boredom or isolation. Or perhaps you're um, worn out by estrangement or alienation with people that you're supposed to be close with. Or perhaps you recognize uh, some apathy in your life and you know you need to move past that. Or perhaps it's disordered love. Part of what it means to be a Christian is to get to know yourself. Know the beloved self that also includes the broken self. They're always together. And the only way you can really find a peace through that is to recognize the consolations and the desolations of life over time and then to lift it up to God in prayer. That's a practice. So the three little points today, 
or to use your mind well by having a questioning life, by engaging in an answering life, and be, by being very serious about the practices you need to use to help you grow in the faith. I commend these ideas and these ways to you. Uh, let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for our humanity. Help us, each of us, to trust and to live into the fact that we're beloved. Help us move away from an unreasonable self-loathing because we are all too aware of our weaknesses and do not give enough credence to our strengths. Help us also to remind others that they're beloved and help us not to define people by their weaknesses but always to speak to their truths. We pray that we're not stalled or stagnant or backsliding and we pray that we can grow. But even when we're in a winter season or a fall season, uh, help us to learn what we can in that space, but move us back into spring and summer so we can experience the joy of, uh, of uh, just being settled in faith. We thank you that you gave us a mind and that we are expected to use our mind in the service of the divine work, in the service of divine care for others. We do thank you also for our hearts, for our passions, that we can place that into the service of the divine. And then we pray that uh, you give us the discipline to practice, practice, practice. For it is simply true, Lord, we know that we can't get good at something unless we practice. Hear this prayer we ask in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and our Savior, and all the people say together, amen. Please join me in an affirmation of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we come to the communion portion of our service. As we take communion here in the sanctuary, we invite you at home to join us and take communion along with us. This is a sacred part of the Christian life, yet we invite all, one and all, to join us at this table. Jesus left no one out, and we do not either. So please, whether you are devout and faithful to worship regularly, whether this is the first service you have been in in forever, whether you have lived what you consider a righteous life, or whether you have been among the greatest of sinners. God loves you, and God invites you to this table. Please join me in the prayer of intercession. As we prepare to partake of the Lord's table, let us come with a spirit of humility, repentance, and thanksgiving. Compassion, God, have mercy on us, we pray. Let us examine our thoughts, our actions, our motives, and our attitudes towards others. O oh, oh, Holy God, God, have mercy and forgive us our shortcomings. Help us to remember our responsibility to our families and to our neighbors, our stewardship to you, and the work you have given to our hands. Guide us, awaken us, energize us for the massive tasks that lay ahead. O oh, oh, living God, we stand in need of your grace, strength, and mercy. As we eat of this bread, which represents your self-sacrificing love, which is the true and living bread. Open our eyes 
to recognize the intimacy that you yearn to share with us. O oh, loving God, teach us to love you above all else, even above our ambitions. As we drink the cup, which represents Christ's willingness to lay down his life for humanity, we thank you for the new covenant, Love Ye One Another, which is written on our hearts. Help us live it out. Let us rejoice because our names are written in the book that only you can open and close. Tender Lord, may, may your great sacrifice of redeeming love renew us for loving service and sacrifice for others. Let, Let our worship, worship now leave us refreshed to serve. Let us not take of this bread and wine if we do not intend to serve others. May the Lord's Supper energize every area of our lives and enable us to transcend our circumstances, our inadequacies, and our enemies. May, May God, who sees us fully, touch and empower us so that, so that our lives will be remarkable testimonies of your presence. We praise you, O God, who made us your people through the death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Abide, Abide in us and throughout this service, our Savior and Redeemer. Fill us with the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit so that when our worship today has finished, we will be forever changed. Hear us as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so it was, on the night he was to be arrested, Jesus, having consumed the Passover meal with his friends, sat back from the table wanting to leave something that they, by which they could remember him, something that could be passed down from generation to generation. He spotted an ordinary loaf of bread, and he picked it up, lifted it up for God's blessing, and then he broke it. And he said to them, Take, eat, this is the bread of life prepared for you. When you eat from this bread, my friends, remember me. And in like manner, he picked up a half-empty pitcher of wine. He asked God's blessing on that, and then he poured it out, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you, that you might have new life, abundant life, full life. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Eat, drink, and be filled.
Let us pray. Eternal, eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with your spiritual food in the sacrament of the body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, we've come together in worship today. We've confessed our sins. We've affirmed our faith. We've heard the word rightly preached and the sacraments appropriately administered. We now come to that time of stewardship. So let's call ourselves together with these words. The earth is the Lord, Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Your bulletin has the link to the webpage where you can uh, send your money. We still uh, collect it in checks and we do our best to make sure that we administer it correctly as to where you want it to go. I remind you one thing is when you do send a check, if you want it to go to something other than your pledge, please write on the memo line where you want that to go. Otherwise, we will let that default to your pledge. Let us pray. Abundant God, you made us in your image and breathed in us a spirit of generosity that is both gift and response. Move us, we pray, to give as we have received, abundantly, generously, and joyfully that our common ministry may ever bear witness to your unfailing grace. In the name of the three in whom we are one, Amen. Our benediction today comes from Sir Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Emeritus, Cape Town, South Africa. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours through him who loves us. Amen. <laughs>